This lecture will provide an overview about what is currently known and speculated about the origins of life on Earth and how the first cells may have evolved. Before going into the topic itself, I would like to briefly introduce myself. My name is Manuel Kleiner and I can be reached at the displayed email address or in the EL building, room 509. I am a postdoc with Dr. Mark Strauss and where I do research on uh, making biological carbon capture more efficient for renewable resource production. I would like to recommend some literature for those of you who would like to read more in depth on the origins of life and the earlier evolution of, on Earth. This literature is by no means mandatory reading. You can see the titles of the two recommended books and one article from the primary literature on the slide. In this lecture, we will first discuss the different lines of evidence that suggest an early origin of life on Earth. We will then discuss two hypotheses on where life originated, namely the panspermia hypothesis and the hypothesis that life originated on Earth. Finally, I would like to draw your attention to the fact that at the end of the lecture, there will be a small assignment, which I would like you to complete by February 3rd, as I will be asking questions about it in the lecture then. Before going into the details of the topic, I want to quickly reiterate some of the main building blocks of contemporary life on Earth. Some of, these, the, some of the basic building blocks are amino acids, fatty acid carbohydrates and nucleobases, which are the basis for sometimes very large biopolymers such as proteins or nucleic acid. These biomolecules fulfill a range of very complex functions, so when we look at this biochemical diversity, we have to ask ourselves, how could these complex organic molecules originate from inorganic precursors? In contrast to other fields in science, scientists in the field of the origins of life cannot base their theories and models on direct observation of the origin of life. After all, we have not invented a time machine yet. So scientists in the field rely on evidence from the geological record about what the conditions were like on early Earth and on experiments that try to at least in part reproduce some of the steps of the origin of life. A confounding factor, particularly when trying to understand general principles of life and its origin, is that we currently only know one form of life, which is life on Earth. So our sample size is very small. So as you can imagine, there are a lot of controversies and competing ideas regarding the origins of life. However, some good models and supporting evidence exist. The first big question that we need to address is, when did life on Earth really start? This is a question that is far from being completely resolved. However, there is a large body of data that provides some good ideas on the timing of the origin of life on Earth. As you know from previous lectures, Earth formed around 4.6 billion years ago, which was the start of the Hadean Eon. After its formation, Earth was exposed to a heavy bombardment with meteorites. Many of these meteorite impacts were large enough to possibly sterilize Earth. So even if life had originated this early on, it would most likely not have been able to survive on Earth. It is currently not known when exactly the heavy bombardment ended. Different scientists predict an, an end of the heavy bombardment either 4.1 billion years ago or 3.8 billion years ago. If you, if you want to learn more about this controversy, you can access a nice article about it on, on the link provided on the slide. So currently there are opposing views on what the late Hadean looked like. The older view is that Earth in the late Hadean was a sterile place hostile to life. More recent reconstructions suggest, however, that Earth was a habitable place in the late Hadean. So when, so when did life originate? What is the data that we have got so far? There are three different kinds of data that help us date the time before which life must have originated. <clears throat> the first type of evidence are fossil stromatolites from Australia that are 3.5 billion years old. Stromatolites are bacterial mass that incorporate sediment particles and produce a characteristic layered structure. And you can see some of these uh, fossil stromatolites here in, on the slide. There's, there is some discussion 
about a potential abiotic origin of these structures, but generally it is accepted that these ancient fossils indeed represent uh, stromatolites. So based on these fossils, life must have originated 3.5 billion years ago or earlier. The second line of evidence is another kind of fossils, so-called microfossils. These microfossils represent what is believed to be individual fossilized cells. The oldest such microfossils were found in Australia and Africa and were dated to be 3.5 billion years old. The third line of evidence is so-called chemofossils. Chemofossils are specific carbon isotope signatures in rock that indicate a biogenic origin. These biogenic signatures in carbon isotopes, isot isotope composition exist because living organisms change the ratio of carbon isotopes as compared to natural background ratios. Until recently, the oldest known chemofossils came from Greenland where, and were 3.83 billion years old. Very recently, in 2015, a group from Stanford reported on potential chemofossils in 4.1 billion year old rock, potentially moving the origin of life to the late Hadean. So to sum this up, we can now say that life very likely originated more than 3.5 billion years ago, and there is some evidence that it even originated much earlier. So the next big question that we have is, where did life actually originate? There are two comp keep competing hypotheses on where life or, uh, originated. One is the hypothesis that life originated elsewhere in the cosmos and migrated to Earth, basically inoculating a lifeless Earth. The main argument brought forth for this hypothesis is that life had roughly 9 to 10 billion years to originate elsewhere before the formation of the Earth. The second hypothesis is that life originated in, on Earth itself from basic building blocks. From both, for both hypotheses, there is a large body of evidence su supporting them, but none of the evidence is conclusive. Or in other word, words, neither one of the two hypotheses has been falsified to date. Let us look at the so-called panspermia hypothesis first. This idea was first put forth in in a comprehensive manner by the Nobel laureate Svante Arrhenius in 19, 1903. In the book shown on the right, he suggested that bacterial spores could be driven across the cosmos by radiation pressure from the stars. The main argument against this first version of panspermia is that unprotected microbes would be instantly killed by, in space by hard radiation. As we will see in the following, the panspermia hypothesis has been refined many times since then to account for this and other things. Several space agencies, including the NASA and uh, European Space Agency, have invested into an extensive amount of research to investigate if panspermia is a, in, the in theory possible. The panspermia hypothesis has been attacked many times in the past as just transferring the problem of the origin of life elsewhere and has and, and it has been argued that it should, does not be considered. The Nobel laureate Francis Crick and famous Origins of Life researcher Leslie Orgel explain in the excerpt from the paper on the left why the panspermia hypothesis can, cannot sim be simply rejected and needs to be considered unless it is falsified. And now I'll let you read the uh, uh, excerpt on the slide. There are different versions of the panspermia hypothesis. For example, the idea of directed panspermia that is, sub that is subject of the paper that was shown on the previous slide. The most commonly discussed and considered version of panspermia is Lytos panspermia. In this hypothesis, it is proposed that microbial life is transported within rocks from one planet to the next. There are three things that microbes would need to survive for Lytospanspermia to happen. First, 
the mi microbes would need to survive planetary ejection, which means that the rocks containing the microbes are blasted off the planet by a meteor impact. Second, the microbes need to survive exposure to interplanetary or interstellar space during transit. And finally, they would need to survive atmospheric re-entry. These three conditions on which the hypothesis depends can actually be experimentally tested. As I mentioned earlier, several space agencies have brought programs investigating these conditions, meaning microbial survival in space and during impact. By now, there is a large body of evidence that microbes can actually survive all three conditions. Although, of course, it could not be tested so far if microbes could, would survive in interstellar space. So this is still being disputed, but for sure, <coughs> microbes can uh, survive in interplanetary space. Now coming to the second main hypothesis on where life originated. This hypothesis is actually that life originated on Earth, from simple, uh, on Earth itself from simple building blocks. This is where it gets really wild, because there is a huge number of opposing theories and models on how it happened, although for some things there is consensus in the scientific community. In the figure on the slide that I extracted from a paper on the origins uh, of life, the authors, in my opinion, nicely depict the uncertainty when it comes to the sequence of events during the origin. The authors simply put all the different ideas, such as the RNA world, compartmentalization, protein world, in one big blob on the bottom, to indicate that the sequence of events is completely unknown. So now, working under the assumption that life really originated on Earth, the question is, where did it originate? It seems hi highly plausible that it either originated in the deep sea or underground, because on early Earth, life on the terrestrial surface or on the surface of the ocean would have been eliminated by the late heavy bombardment and the strong UV radiation from the sun, which at the time could still reach the surface due to the lack of the ozone layer. Some basic assumptions that most, if not all, origins of life on Earth theories have in common are the following two. Life was assembled from organic molecules present on early Earth. And the second one, is the atmosphere of early Earth was free of oxygen because the oxygen in our atmosphere is a product of life. The absence of oxygen allowed for certain organic molecules to accumulate because they are much more stable when oxygen is not present. So if life was assembled from basic organic molecules on Earth, where did these building blocks come from? So far, three sources have been put forth and lots of evidence for their contribution exists. These sources are not mutually exclusive, but may rather have contributed different types of building blocks. The three, uh, the three sources are A. Generation of organic molecules by chemical reactions in the atmosphere and the ocean. B. Gen uh, the second one, generation on mineral surfaces at deep sea hydrothermal vents. And C. Import, import of organic molecules from space. Now let us look at the evidence for these sources of organic molecules in early Earth. The most famous experiment in regard to the origin of building blocks is what is known today as the Miller-Urey experiment. In the 1920s, the Russian biochemist Oparin and the British biologist Hal Dane proposed that organic molecules could have been spontaneously created by chemical reactions fueled by sunlight on early Earth. In the 1950s, Stanley Miller and Harold Urey, Harold Urey um, put this hypothesis to the test by carrying out their now famous experiment. In the experiment, Miller and Urey tried to simulate the conditions of early Earth, with the aim to see if organic molecules would be produced under these conditions. They added some gases such as hydrogen, ammonium, ammonia and methane to, to simulate a prim primitive atmosphere. They simulated lightning in the atmosphere with electrical sparks, and they also had a hot ocean. After running the experiment for one week, the water contained many amino acids and other organic molecules. After this famous experiment uh, was done, uh, many experiments with different conditions followed. 
What we have learned from all these experiments is that many, if not all, essential building blocks of life could have been produced under early Earth conditions. Another likely source for organic molecules for pre prebiotic chemistry on Earth is, is import from space by meteorites. Meteorites found on Earth have been scrutinized for their content in organic molecules, and in some meteorites a large diversity of organic compounds were found. On this slide, for example, you see part of the famous Murchison meteorite and the kinds of organic molecules that it carried. Maybe you remember from the media that last year, humans for the first time managed to land an unmanned spacecraft on a comet. This mission gave us some new insights into what kinds of compounds, com compounds comets impacting on Earth may have brought with them. The Philae lander found 16 organic comp compounds on the comet in its first survey, survey. More might be discovered later. So again, it's clear that cosmic sources of organic molecules could have played an important role in prebiotic chemistry on Earth. Now that we know how basic organic compounds could have been formed or imported to Earth, the question is how did life arise out of this primordial soup? Or as Carl Sagan put it, the organic molecules only represent the notes of the music of life, but not the music itself. For example, how did the more complex biomolecules such as DNA or proteins arise? Two essential attributes of modern life are replication and metabolism. Now, when we are trying to understand the origin of life in this regard, we are faced with a kind of a chicken and egg problem. Both these attributes depend on each other, meaning to replicate one needs metabolism, and metabolism is encoded by the replica replicating genetic material. So the big question is, which one was first? This is a true chicken and egg problem. In regards to this question, the scientific community researching the origin of origins of life can be divided in two camps. There are advocates of both a metabolism first and a replicator first model. Although in recent times there is a tendency of scientists to lean towards a metabolism first model. I will now present both models. The proponents of the replicator first model think that replication came before metabolism and that RNA was the critical molecule for this to happen. So this model is often referred to as the RNA world. As you have learned, most biochemical reactions in life forms today are catalyzed by proteins, so-called enzymes. However, in the early 1980s, Thomas Czech discovered that the information carrying RNA can also catalyze biochemical reactions and its own replication. And these are called, uh, uh, RNAs that can do that are called ribozymes. This got him actually a Nobel Prize in 1989. So this finding of ribozymes led to the idea that self-replication of RNA molecules could have been one of the first steps in the origin of life. Since then, this model has been refined and parts of it have been actually tested in the lab. One of the key ideas in the RNA world model is that clay minerals are, are thought to have provided the surface for the initial RNA polymerization reactions to happen. A large amount of experimental work has shown that some of the necessary steps in an RNA world scenario can work in, a lab, in laboratory experiments. One of the largest counter arguments against the RNA world uh, model put forth by its opponents is that it's unlikely that the concentrations of RNA precursors were high enough on early Earths for it to work. In more recent years, the idea that metabolism evolved first has gained more and more support. In general, the metabolism first model assumes that a primitive metabolism evolved first and that the products of this primitive metabolism provided the raw materials for increasingly complex reactions in a type of feed-forward mechanism. This, this would over time generate high, higher complexity, ultimately leading to complex biomolecules such as DNA, RNA, and proteins. In this metabolism first scenario, the first step was the origin of an autotrophic metabolism, which means metabolism, which means a metabolism that generates organic compounds from the inorganic precursors carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide. 
It is thought that this primitive metabolism evolved at deep sea hydrothermal vents, where we have a high pressure, steep temperature gradients and the presence of a var variety of mineral surfaces. Iron and sulfur containing min minerals are thought to have played a crucial role in this scenario, which is why it is frequently called the iron sulfur world. There are, of course, many other types of competing origin of life theories, but the RNA world and the iron sulfur world models are currently most widely discussed ones. Another one, uh, another important step, and for, for the last one that we will be discussing today is uh, that for the origin of life is the origin of the cellular envelope. This is a crucial step because it is important for life in several reasons. So currently it is thought that primitive metabolism and replication originated first and that soon after these processes were confined into compartments, into a cellular envelope. So just let's have a quick look at why compartmentation is very important for life. First, compartmentation keeps reactions of a metabolism in each other's proximity, so actually reactions can occur and the products can be used for further reactions. Second, the metabolism that is encoded by genes, so in, by the replicator, the replicating um, molecule, is in, kept in proximity uh, of these genes. And genes are kept together, which then enables evolution to happen. So natural selection can then select for genes because metabolism influences the fitness of the genes uh, and, and their, their products because the, their products are used. And third, uh, the, of course, compartmentation provides structure and organization, which allows more complex uh, uh, processes to occur. So there are, again, many theories of how the first cells originated, but it is generally accepted that simple vesicles would have formed quite spontaneously once phospholip phospholipids or similar molecules uh, were available. As an assignment prior to the lecture, I would like you to carry out the following thought experiment, which involves a few calculations. This thought experiment addresses the question of how quickly the first cells could have spread and evolved after life originated. For the details on this assignment, see the slide, please. 